on this side. This side. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks for having us. This will be fun. Um, so uh, I guess let's go back and um, and can you can you talk I guess first a little bit about um, your background and and how you started BuzzFeed. Uh, sure. So I I never um, planned to start a company. It wasn't you know um, I, I was a, a, a high school teacher in New Orleans and mm -hmm. um, I that was that was sort of my first job out of out of school and I got interested in educational technology and ended up at grad school at the MIT Media Lab to study educational technology. Um, and then I kind of had an accident while I was in graduate school that sort of led to an intellectual interest, and then that intellectual interest eventually led to starting a business. What was the accident? So the, ac the accident was I was um, procrastinating writing my, my master's thesis, and um, Nike had just launched this thing where you could customize your shoes with a word or a phrase. And, and I was messing around, and I tried first like a four-letter word, and they wouldn't let you put it in. Um, and then I tried the word sweatshop, and it accepted it, and so, uh, and I put my credit card in, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to get these shoes that say sweatshop under the swoosh, um, and then the next day, they wrote, a customer service representative wrote to me and said, uh, the word sweatshop is inappropriate slang, and so I wrote back, and I said, no, it's, it's in the dictionary, it means a shop or factory where workers toil under unhealthy conditions, and, and then they, um, they, uh, wrote back another excuse, and we kind of had this, this funny back and forth where uh, um, at the end they said, look, we reserve the right to not send you these shoes. You have to change the ID. And I said, okay, I'll change the ID, but can you at least send me a picture of the 10-year-old Vietnamese girl who stitches them together? <laughs> and then they didn't write back. Um, so, so am I like, uh, do I need a ear, an ear switch? A hand mic? Does that right? Yeah, I could do a hand mic. Should I take this off then? It's worked. Okay, but do I have to have it if I'm gonna? <laughs> <laughs> I have to have it. <laughs> Can I get a third mic? Um. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll. All right, there we go. This, this is really going well, guys. This is really going well. All right. Can you <laughs> Are you gonna pull it out of my back now? All right. All right. Here we go. Um, this might this this might actually lead to starting another company related to audio. Um, so uh, this is good. I kind of want to do this every time I do a talk. Um, so uh, so uh, I share. Uh, so th this was in 2001, before Facebook, before Twitter. Blogging was a new thing. It wasn't um, like people didn't expect things to go viral or talk about things going viral back then. And I pasted the email together, and I sent it to a, about a dozen friends, and then they started passing it on to their friends. They started passing it on to their friends, and we it, it ended up becoming what what used to be called email forwards. I don't know if you remember the dark ages of social, where people had this impulse to share, and there was this totally broken way of sharing, which was which was um, to forward something to your entire inbox or you know address book. And and so if you were an anti sweatshop activist, you would get this email 27 times. Um, and now on Facebook, you'll get it once, and it'll say 27 of your friends shared this. So social has become much more organized, and things work a lot better. But even back in 2001, people had this impulse to share, and this became something that ended up reaching millions of people online. I ended up on the Today Show with Nike's head of global PR and Katie Couric debating sweatshop labor, which I knew nothing about. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, why, why, how is it, it, it seemed new and different that it was, that, that a student with no connections in the media could reach millions of people without having access to a printing press or broadcast pipe or any of the things that you normally needed to meet, reach a mass audience. And so I became fascinated with that idea. I started walking around MIT's campus talking to people who knew about network theory and um, started teaming up with my sister as a stand-up comic, making new things that would spread on, on the web and had a few other things that ended up you know, being made in a weekend and reaching millions of people. And, and um, really got obsessed with the idea that that the media industry was kind of changing because uh, uh, or, or the media industry the industry wasn't changing but there was this new thing that you could do which is that felt like magic which is make something and if people loved it and wanted to share it it could reach this huge audience and that felt new and different and no one was really thinking about that and 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 I just started to really explore that no wait can you hear oh, no, okay good um, and that led to Huffington Post um, so first, um, it led to Huffington Post kind of indirectly because a 
this uh, bi business retired businessman named Ken Lair f um, was doing political work, and he wanted to use some of the things I learned. And he heard about the work I was doing, and he's like, "Can you use this for a political cause I'm working on?" So I worked with him on that. And then at the end of it, he's like, "This is really cool." He's like, "I know business. You know the internet. Why don't we start a company together?" And we didn't know what the company would be. And then a little while later, he, he, he was like, our company with Ariana. And I was like, what? And he had been traveled to Los Angeles, met Ariana Huffington, and he was kind of putting together this, this company. And I didn't really have much interest in starting a company, but, but it, it seemed kind of like a fun adventure. And I, f I flew to go meet Ariana before deciding whether to do it and like stayed in her, her, this guest bedroom at her house in Brentwood and came out at like 7 in the morning. And she was already having her first breakfast meeting, and, and she was like, "Oh, come and you know have your breakfast." And then clearing the table, and then it was like the next you know breakfast meeting was with me, and then we were like flying to to Sacramento to meet the governor, and it, I don't know, it was like it was like this kind of thing. I was like, "Well, this seems like an adventure," <laughs> and so um, <laughs> so I ended up um, starting Huffington Post with Kenny and Ariana, and during that period, realizing that business is actually kind of fun because with my early projects, you'd make something, it would take off, and then it would kind of crash when it was done, especially with content, right? It would, you know, you'd make something like a, a website like, or, or a, the, the Nike email over a few months, it would get spread, and then it would kind of die off once people had seen it. And with Huffington Post, it was this cool new challenge of you make things, and you make more things, and then you get more revenue, and you get investment, and you can keep building things over time and make something that, that grows and grows over time. And I got really... Um, I got really excited by the idea of startups as being the vehicle for for building something over time um, that can be enduring and that can grow. And so, can you? And how, how did that lead then to BuzzFeed? And can you talk about the beginnings of BuzzFeed? Yeah. So BuzzFeed um, started as a lab. I mean, I, w I was used to working in schools and research labs, and Huffington Post was was really a business and was growing, and we were. It, it was very much like. Um, you know, in the flow of a startup where you're really just like pushing hard on the startup and I wanted a space to be able to explore and experiment. And so I got this little office in Chinatown and um, started BuzzFeed with John Johnson, who was the guy who ran a nonprofit I previously worked at, and Ken Lair, and we, and it was really uh, almost a, a lab for experimenting. And it was very much like, as I remember, it was, um, you, you had no aspirations to do media. It was, you were going to sort of study the science of virality and then s maybe sell software to other companies or something, right? Was the original idea? Yeah, and it wasn't a very thought out original idea and partly the reason that I was able to do it was because John Johnson was more of a philanthropist than a business person mm -hmm. and he was okay funding something. I didn't have money to fund it and he was okay fund funding something that didn't have a c any kind of clear business goal that was more an intellectual pursuit or a lab. And so I, I didn't know if it would ever be a business, and if it was a business, I thought it would be a tech business, not an editorial business. Mm -hmm. um, and so, ha yeah, so then what? So then Huffington Post got bought. So then Huffington Post, so I started spending AOL. more time at, at, yeah. at BuzzFeed and sort of splitting my time between HuffPost and BuzzFeed, and then when Huffington Post got bought by AOL, it was a natural breaking point. And then I realized that without Huffington Post in my life, <laughs> that I, I missed the intersection of content and technology. Like I liked being part of making the actual content, not just building the tech. Mm -hmm. and, and I had that at Huffington Post and then, and then at BuzzFeed, I didn't have that because it was really this lab. And so we decided that we were going to, to hire an editorial team, hire Ben Smith, who was formerly at Politico, build out a team of reporters and really, um, you know, take all the stuff we had been learning about why people share and how people share and use it to build a, a new kind of media company for the social world. So I don't th I think a lot of people, there's a lot of misimpressions. Um, Oops. Okay, that was. Sorry, um, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, a lot of people misunderstand BuzzFeed. Uh, in my view. I mean, I'm biased. I'm your friend and, and investor. But um, you have 800 people now, um, 200 million plus unique visitors, by some measures, like a top, like Quantcast, I think has you as the ninth biggest website. Um, people think, a lot of people think of, associate you with the kind of, you know, Facebook quizzes and lists and things like this, but you actually have, um, you know, very large kind of like long form journalism, tech, business. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, so when BuzzFeed started, it wasn't possible to build a, a big media property um, or a, a big site on so on social 
-hmm. you know, the, um, the iPhone hadn't come out yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Facebook was still about what you do with your friends, and Twitter was about what you had for lunch. Like like Facebook really went through because, like, it, it, people, it's 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 easy to forget now, but it went through multiple eras where it started off, you know, just with people's profile pages, and then the news feed, which, which of course I think was like 2006, which was a big deal. But then it was still, you know, so and so changed their relationship status, and it wasn't until three or four. I mean three or four years ago, long after you'd started BuzzFeed, that it became much more about kind of a news feed, like a news in the sense of media feed. Yeah, and I think so you, done, you started that. Like, I remember when you did it, and I had invested because I was your friend and I had a lot of confidence in you, but, you know, he talking at the time, like 2008, saying people are going to read their news in a social network sounded like a very strange idea, I remember. Yeah, and I think the social social platforms go through this... this um, tend to go through the same evolution when you look at a lot of them where mm -hmm. they start out as being personal, like a way of connecting with people in your I life. See. Then they s people start posting kittens mm -hmm. and internet memes <laughs> and, and that kind of, kind of, um, it's probably, of it's probably happened fun. with Twitter too. Like now it's become a very much a business tool for most people I know, yeah, but it started off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then it moves from the kittens yeah. to, and there was a time when P Twitter was like what your friends are up to around the city. And yeah. you know, like, and then it was like the cute kittens and the memes. And then it becomes, oh, the serious stuff and the news and, and more professional content mm -hmm. and entertainment content. And so w BuzzFeed really... Um, Did you know that was going to... You, you thought that was going to happen back then? or um, I didn't think it would be as happen as big as it happened. Okay. I, th I kind of thought no, when, we, when we said, okay, BuzzFeed's going to take investment and be a real company, I thought we would be a niche company where social and mobile is what matters the most. And that there still would be the big the big sites would still be I based see. on you know huge front pages and and SEO and, and it, like yeah, that. okay, but I, I I I that's what I was interested in. Okay, and I hoped it would be bigger, and it felt like a better way. And we always use sharing as the metric at BuzzFeed because taking if you read something and you think it's worth passing on to someone you care about or someone you know that felt felt like a much bigger endorsement that the content was meaningful than than just um, a view or a click. Mm -hmm. And that also was something that would drive growth. So it had a double benefit. It had a business benefit of when people share things, it, it leads to growth and more people reading it. But it also had a quality signal embedded in the share, which is I'm only going to share this if my reputation's at stake and I'm sharing it and my f I'm giving it to my friend. And, it, and, and so it, it had a, a, met, a, a better metric for quality in in tied in share. So it was like a nice combination of quality and growth tied together which is one of the things that let BuzzFeed grow. But initially it was the fun, entertaining content. And when we saw that people were starting to share news on Twitter and, and Facebook, we said, whoa, we don't have anyone making news content. I love the news business. I love making, I love, uh, you know, I think working with reporters and journalists is one of the most rewarding things in my job. And, and all of a sudden there was a possibility to do that and have it work as a business because news was moving to social. And so that was more of a thing where we said, oh, you know, we can really invest in news. And, and in fact, aggregation works great for Google, but having the best scoop or original story works better in social because you want to share the original story. You want to mm -hmm. share the scoop. You, wanna, you don't want to share the, the sort of rehash of the story. Do you think there's any tension between having kind of the lists and the, and the funny stuff and having, does that undermine the, the serious news? Um, I, I think it does in some people's minds. I mean, I think, I think um, um, Younger audiences, it, ha it has a less of that effect where they're used to seeing in Facebook's newsfeed or in Twitter a silly thing and a serious thing kind of mixed together. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's a little bit more normal. If you grew up w reading newspapers and you're used to you know, clear sections and the funny p sections and the crossword is sort of in the back in a separate, separate cordoned off section, um, it can be a little bit jarring. One of the things we've been doing to address that is, is – um, you know, making the BuzzFeed News brand more distinct and not putting the LOL circles on the top and things like that on if it's a serious story. Uh, and, and I think there's cues like that, that that can make a big difference. The other thing is that people discover the content often not from on BuzzFeed. So like, you know, Ben, after, after Ben joined, he did a tremendous job covering the election. And, and he, was, he had a great team of hungry political reporters and they were living on Twitter, and, they were, and, and, and so the political establishment in D.C. thought BuzzFeed was a political site because they would find us in the Twitter stream, click through, and find a, a great reporting about you know, the polit pol political news. And then when they would see, go to the front page of BuzzFeed, they'd be totally confused. They'd be like, whoa, why is there this fun, entertaining content here? Or what, what, you know, I didn't even realize they did that. So there is a little bit of um, social exploding the bundle and content going wherever people 
where content going to people wherever they are and being more personalized for their for their interests and and the t and it's not like someone's dropping the complete corpus of BuzzFeed on the doorstep every morning and, and you're judging yeah. it based on its totality. You're judging it based on the part that you are sharing and consuming. Uh, some people say, you know, they, they, they say they accuse you of, of clickbait. They call this a word, right? So um, I think there's, in my mind, maybe I'll, uh, like, th there's two problems with that phrase. Like one is you actually don't um, optimize for clicks. You optimize for shares and they're actually pretty different because if you, want someone to share something, you, you actually don't want people to click on it unless they actually, like, you, you want someone to, to if someone, cl if, if you have like a curiosity gap, like if you have a headline that um, doesn't, that, that makes the article sound different than it is, people will be upset and they won't share it. Um, and so in fact, if you look at your headlines, they're incredibly literal. 12 places, fun places to go in Italy or something, right? They're not sort of tantalum, like they're the opposite of the sort of the, the so-called curiosity gap, number one. Number two, let's talk about your business model. You don't make money on clicks, unlike almost all other media sites. Um, so you actually don't have an incentive to optimize those things, which is, I find it's frustrating when I'm trying to describe you guys to people and they say, oh, they just, you know, try to get as many clicks as they can. Well, actually they don't even, like you don't even understand the business model, which, can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, so I, I think, um, there's different kinds of clickbait, and mm -hmm. I think part of the problem is people don't have a clear definition for these things. Yeah. One kind of clickbait is something where it says, um, "This is this, wh this where is an amazing story." You it's won't an amazing it, story, yeah. and, and you'll never guess like you know who who this person's dating, and it has a picture of like two celebrities, and then it's like a pic from a movie that they were in together, and they're not dating or something, right? Where it's it's like some deceptive thing to get people there, and then when you get there, you're like, "Oh, they were lying mm -hmm. to me." The, the other kind of headline that people sometimes do is the one where it contains no information, where it's just like, you'll never believe yeah. what you'll see when you click this link and it's going to blow your mind yeah. and it, you don't know what it is. And you're like, well, I mean, I'll click it because I want to know what it is. That's yeah. really more the curiosity gap. Um, and, um, and, and we kind of try to do kind of the opposite, which is, like you said, like put a sample of the content and then describe exactly what the content is because we want people to to click it because they're really interested and in, into whatever the thing is. Because and then that's feel satisfied so they share it. Because yes, that's, your, that's share the it. action you optimize for is that they right. share with their friends, right? And so if, if they click it and don't share it, you know, and, and, and so I, and now we're like we're, we're starting now to look at lots of other metrics for like, like so, so sharing is more meaningful because it involves a social relationship with someone else. But we're also starting to see, like, like Buzz, so BuzzFeed Life focuses on f uh, food, DIY, fashion, that kind of stuff. And one of the things that we're looking at there is when we post a recipe, we can see that, we can see that um, it gets a million views. And then we look on Instagram and we see people posting pictures of the food that they cooked and commenting that it was delicious. And if, if they comment that it's delicious, we're like, oh, it was good. A million people saw this. And they actually liked the food that was cooked. If a million people see it and the food was terrible, then we had like a negative impact on the world. Yep. And so share, you know, so sharing is closer to caring about sharing is closer to the sort of what impact does it have on people's actual yeah. lives. Um, and with news, you know, we look at does it change laws? Does it does it create change in the world? Um, and then with a lot of our entertainment content, we look at does it cause people to connect with their friends in a way that like where they laugh with their friends or they sh share sh yeah. a shared emotion with their friends. And so trying to go even beyond the share to look at real world impact of are we making media that is meaningful to people and and allows people to connect and laugh with their friends or to make better food or better fashion or be get fit or what all the things that we do with life or ha or changing laws. And so. And so it's um, continually trying to can move up the chain of what, on a human level, does this media mean to people? Yep. And can we focus on that? Because in the long term, that's what matters. All the other kind of metrics people look at are, are kind of um, uh, secondary metrics that are only correlated with what you actually yeah. care about, which is, is this something that people care about and, and does it have a positive impact on their life? I think of it as like you, um, you know, you can, so people get so focus on the format of a list, for example, and they, um, the way I think of it is, you know, you could have the same, you could have an article in the New York Times, it's like five fun summer cocktails, and it's written in a prose style, and then you have a similar thing, which is a list of five cocktails. The list ends up being a much more um, suitable format for social, because you'll see if you go to the Facebook comments, people will say, I love number three, 
in a way that you can like refer to things, you can share each item individually. I like this number three, I'm gonna share only this item. Um, it ends up just fitting the format much better. Um, and uh, often like the actual content is very similar to what you'd see in a, let's say a food magazine or something. Yeah, and it's easier to scroll. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one, the, the, the screen short thing that where, where you, you had a blog post where you did a screen grab of a paragraph. Yeah. In a way, it's similar to the logic of a list because lists also make it easier for people to sample content in the stream. And then if they like the sample, go and g eat the whole thing or, or yeah. you know, and so. As opposed to a slideshow or something where you have to go through it in order. Yeah, so like with your thing, with your blog post, yeah. like you take the best paragraph or the paragraph yeah. that's most interesting, you put that in the stream, and some people will just read that paragraph and get the gist of what you were saying. And other people will say, well, that's really interesting, I want more, and click through. And, and so, you know, we have, we have about 15 billion impressions on other platforms that link to BuzzFeed. So, so this massive cloud of links. We want to put as much value into those links so that when people see them on Facebook or Twitter or other places, even if they don't click them, they should see something of value that lets that, that adds, informs them if it's news or and let you know and um, helps them live a better life if it's life or or makes them laugh if it's if it's buzz and and having that that massive uh, um, that massive. Um, um, if that massive audience that is just seeing these links is seeing just pointers somewhere else with that are devoid of information, it, it's um, a less good experience. And so out of that 15 billion, it's like 400 million who are clicking through and coming mm -hmm. to BuzzFeed's site. But we care about the people who don't click through and come to our site. We care about people who are seeing our content you know, elsewhere on, elsewhere on the web and even if they don't click. So let's talk about your business model, which is different than most um, media companies. Yeah, so we, we took the approach from the beginning of not doing banner ads just because I, I hated banner ads. Um, and at the time it was the main way that people made money on websites. And so it was like, it, it, it was, uh, we were a small site at the time and we didn't, weren't making any money. We were losing money. And so you go to a board meeting and you'd be like, so like, when are you going to put the banner ads on the site? That's like the next step. And we decided to not do, or, you know, do that. And, and it was, um, it was hard because we would we would try to sell a non-standard kind of advertising to big agencies when we were a relatively small site, and fortunately we found a few forward-thinking marketers who 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 and, and our basic pitch at the time was, why don't you make great content like the content that's on BuzzFeed's site, but make it about your brand. So if it's your GE, make it about so cool things you can do with solar panels, and if you're, you know, um, HBO, make it about Game of Thrones or you know what you know. And, and and we took that approach and and it just was the first people who used it was just like wow it's ten times the higher click through rate you actually get sharing you actually get earned media and that's allowed us to scale our revenue much bigger and faster than a lot of the companies that are doing banner advertising. So the, and the controversy around native native advertising, as they call it, or branded content, is the idea people think people think of like that there was that very um, they, I think it was the Atlantic that did that Scientology thing. Right, there's been some there's been some examples of very bad native advertising where basically they're trading the brand of the media organization for you know it looks as if they're endorsing something that they aren't. Um, you're like if you go your stuff first of all your stuff's all clearly labeled, but also it's like you know ten ten cool things about Game of Thrones. Like it doesn't it's not about sort of impugning your media credibility onto the brand, right? It's yeah, we did How Will You Die at Game of Thrones, and it was a quiz, and you answer all these questions, and it would be like you'll yeah. be decapitated or you'll you know it had all the different ways. Um, and uh, you know, over a million views, and in a way, the fact that HBO was publishing it, they were they were the byline, uh, gave it more credibility. You know, I just think it's so it's interesting that like, you know, the New York Times, for example, s will spend I imagine an incredible amount of time writing you know brilliant journalism and great articles, and then they slap you, literally. I have you know like you'll see teeth whitening ads and you know instant weight loss at banner ads all over the website, and then they complain that the that they aren't monetizing as well as print. Whereas, whereas in print, they have this, you know, whatever, some big fold-out car ad or something. And so, you know, if you if you treat the business like this second-class citizen and put on, you know, teeth whitening ads, it's you're not it's not going to perform well. It, se it seems very like sort of to me at least it seems like very straightforward kind of you know wisdom that you want to make high-quality products, including the advertising. Yeah, I mean, part of it is that some really g excellent editorial organizations treat business as a second-class thing. 
and don't care about business that much and see it as a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. And during the period of, of newspapers, regional monopolies, it was possible to feel that way and still make tons of money and be really profitable because mm -hmm. there was the only way you could really reach an audience was through the classifieds yep. and through the ads in the local newspaper. And there were only, you know, one dominant one and maybe one or two secondary ones. So, so you actually could make, um, massive amounts of money and look your no look down your nose at business and at advertising and treat the people who are doing the business stuff um, like second class citizens and really at BuzzFeed we we try to um, you know build a culture where where people realize how interdependent everyone in the company is and you know the business team is is doing innovative stuff to improve advertising and to change the way advertising works and advertising is part of culture and and you know people hate that when you click through to an article there's a banner ad that prevents you from seeing the content and all these things jiggling around that like you know ruin your experience and if we can make a better advertising experience that's good for the world and it's good for our business and then by the way that also allows us to hire foreign correspondents around the world hire a really amazing investigative journalism team you know in expand in other countries and do all these other things that are important on the editorial side and so the the um editor you know for the most part you know, there's some reporters who work at BuzzFeed who are totally disinterested in how we do business, which is fine. But it, for the most part, there's not a feeling of, oh, they're, they're second class and we're the ones who are doing the important heroic work. Mm -hmm. But the business side really respects the journalists. And when we have, you know, um, Gina Moore come back from Liberia where she was covering the, Libo um, the Ebola uh, crisis and does a talk internally, the people who work on the business side are like amazed at the reporting she did, that she was breaking stories that, you know, from, from you know, and, and doing really important journalistic work. So it, 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 it's like having respect across edit and business and also having a, a church state divide is something that, you know, is, is the way media companies should have you know should run even 100 years ago and today and i think right now with all the change people sometimes forget there's certain enduring things and if you can if you can embrace um um you know innovation but also keep certain things like a church state separation you know solid and have a company culture that that transcends it you know that's that's um that's uh you know a better way to run things yeah. So you're making a lot of investments in video right now and it's it seems like an interesting time in video facebook's getting really into video um, investing heavily in it. I think Twitter's launching a video thing soon. Um, it seems like the infrastructure, whatever, bandwidth, et cetera, is at a point now where you can, you know, do high quality video everywhere. Um, you know, what's, is this, it seems like the next five years, the story will be video in, in the yeah, we're, media we're, he we're heading back to a pre-literate pre pre society where no one will read words. Yeah. Um, so and uh, gifs and memes. in two to three years from now, there'll be no words. Um, that's my, my, my big prediction. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that, that there are probably too many words like people use, pe I mean, I'm joking a little that we're going to preliterate society, but there are, there, there are lots of uses of words that you could do better with video, you know, when you're explaining things and you could just show it, you know, sometimes it, you know, so I think that, that the fact that now mobile mobile video is possible means that, I mean, we're just seeing massive growth in video. And so we have, we have a studio, um, BuzzFeed Motion Pictures in Los Angeles. There's about 150 people there. We're at, we have a four acre studio lot um, where we make all original video. We have built out sets. So if, if the people creating videos have an idea and they want to shoot it in a bar or they want to shoot it in a classroom, they can just go to the set that's already built and dress it for their thing. We have a dentist chair, you know, all these things. So you can, you can make video content. And then the video lives in native formats on Facebook, YouTube, and other places. So unlike one website that gets shared between platforms, we're creating content that gets uploaded in multiple places. And then we get data back from all the different sources. So, so a lot of people are, f are in the media world right now, I think that they're sort of afraid of outsourcing their, their web hosting and their video hosting to the social networks. You, you aren't afraid of that? Um, no, I mean, I, 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 my goal in all these things is to be is to be indifferent to the to the business, um, re, uh, um, the, to the to, to the business logic, so that you can do what's best for the consumer, right? So one of our um, biggest advertisers doesn't advertise on BuzzFeed; they just work with a video team, and the videos are on YouTube. And you know, we did but with Nestle Purina, we did this video, Dear Kitten, that was part of actually a larger series, 15 million views, massive. Um, you know, um, uh, effectiveness in the advertising, all the ways we me you measure advertising effectiveness, like the, the purchase intent of wet cat food went way up when people saw this video. But the video is, is really entertaining, fun, 15 million views, most of that organic from people sharing it. 
that's not on BuzzFeed's platform. And so when you look at that, you say, okay, why should we be scared of making great things that people love that work for our advertiser that get distributed all across the web? And we're doing a lot of thinking now of, as a company of how to become even more distributed and, and to, um, you know, embrace formats that are faster and, and, and push content out to the edge where the consumer already is. And just so long as we have data back and it's working, you know, we, we can figure out how to make it work as a business. Mm -hmm. And so I want to figure out how, to, how do we make it work as a business on our own site and how do we, you know, make it work as a business distributed. And if we can do that, then we should just make decisions based on what's best for the, for the consumer or the reader. So let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. I, I imagine there are entrepreneurs here, given that we're in San Francisco. Um, what, uh, can, can you talk about, I guess, a few topics. Um, how, do you, how do you build a great team? Um, it's one. It's one of the hardest, most important things. And I think if you talk to people who've built companies that are, that get to you know anything over fifteen, twenty, fifty employees, you know, or even even in the early stage, you know, people talk a lot about how building the team is such an important thing. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, it, and, and the culture is such an important thing. I think that like the employer-employee relationship in startups is like pretty different. You're kind of trying to find people who have a r rough set shared values and who want to go after something big. And you know, in, in in and when you think about like a boss, you think, oh, the boss tells the people what to do or whatever. But like for most of the people that I work with, like if they quit, they would have an amazing opportunities other places, and it would be worse for me than it would be for them. And so, you know, you really want to figure out how do you how do you um, attract people like that, where where like you're sort of working for them, <laughs> you know. And and a lot of what I spend time thinking about is how do you make a environment at BuzzFeed where the people can can do their best work and be more productive than if they were somewhere else and can can pursue bigger things and and do and and be and 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 be have better co colleagues and collaborators and 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 that is something that you know is a lot of a lot of work but is something that is like hugely important to our continued you know growth and success mm -hmm. and what about how do you sort of keep the culture like create a good culture and keep it that way as you grow um I mean, it's 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 really hard. I mean, I think you know, there's in the in the media industry, um, you know, like like Silicon Valley, there's all kinds of companies that really value culture, and you know, it gets represented as perks. You know, like you have free food and all these kinds of you know, yoga and things like that, and that is one way of showing that you care about employees. But it's really more about the work and and caring about the mission and all all of that. And, and I think when you look in media, there's less of that because you have these hundred year old plus companies. And so like, you know, if you just don't yell at people, you're like better than, mo than a lot of media companies, you know, or if you like share are more transparent and share information with your team. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you um, don't tell people to do arbitrary, stupid things just because I told you, you know, like, like you're ahead of, a, of, of certain companies. Yep. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, in some of what we've done is combine, um, take a lot of the ways that Silicon Valley companies think about culture mm -hmm. and apply it to media where it's much more rare um, and, and uh, not built a company that is, is um, you know, incredibly hierarchical and command and control, but thinking about how do you have small groups of people who have a lot of autonomy, but have a, um, um, transparency about what the company as a whole is doing and what it what it values so that they can act autonomously without having to always kind of go up and ask someone like well what should I be doing and then and then being able to recognize when something is working and be able to give it more resources like video we yeah. acquired Zay Frank's company which was four people or three people and I told them like well you know I you know it will we'll support and invest this in, in this but you know you're, you're building something from scratch so like I don't know like we don't know if it's gonna work or not but when it was clear it was working we gave resources we you know supported it and built it and now it's one of the most important parts of our business and so I think that's the uh, another thing is being able to let people build things inside of a company um, and not just tell people what to do but but uh, find people who can actually build new things so I think in a few minutes we're gonna take questions all right so I g if people want to um, have questions that can go up to the mics and we'll do that in a few minutes but I guess um, I'll ask a few final questions um, one is what what are some of the things you've like the biggest mistakes you've made as an entrepreneur things you've learned things you wish you knew before well I, I actually learned um, 
a huge amount from reading your blog that so when you were in, w w when you were in he didn't know I was going to say that but when you were when you were in New York and you're writing you know um, about how should you do an angel round and how, and how do how do investors operate and how you know what do you do in those meetings like when I started BuzzFeed I wasn't planning to start a company Huffington Post was started in a in a in a kind of more traditional way of wi where my co-founders were were experienced business people who are a lot older than me and um, and BuzzFeed was kind of also started in a kind of non-traditional way. So like all of the structure, we were an LLC and not a C corp. And we, I think, we one, I think one of the yeah. good, great, like people like Fred Wilson, Paul Graham, like they, all of these things that used to be very mysterious, at least when I started off, I started my first company, like you didn't, you couldn't find this information, like how, what's in a term sheet? What's, how do you pitch find a VC? You know, I don't know. So I think one of the nice things has happened over the last decade, at least in the f fundraising and a few other topics, it's all been sort of opened. Yeah, so we made all these legal mistakes and structural yeah. mistakes and problems that, that we have been able to fix, but was like a lot of work to fix. Yeah. And if we had done them right in the first place, like it would have been a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so that I, I don't know, that kind of stuff. And I, I think yeah. that now you have the opposite thing sometimes, which is I was a... I was an entrepreneur who didn't actually know he was an entrepreneur and didn't know anything about business and didn't know how you raise financing. And, but I was passionate about an idea, which is that the media industry is, is, is changing. Mm -hmm. And these parlor tricks of making things viral was going to be how the media industry would eventually yeah. work, which was an insight that, that, that let us build a big, a big company. But I didn't know how to actually do a company. Now you have people who know how to do companies yeah. inside and out, but they don't have any idea or insight or they don't even know what the company is going to be about. And they're like walking around saying, what should I do my company on? Yeah. Are there any hot trends that I should work on? And they know everything about how you do a financing and yeah. who you network with. It's true. Yeah. You know, it's like a weird, it's like it's weird. It's probably the same. I would guess it's the same as any other industry when it becomes, cause it is, because it's gotten more attention and gotten more popular. Um, probably, you know, Hollywood and the, whatever it was in the you know, 80s or something when it, um, but because uh, um, I, I agree with you, there's a lot of people who, f who you get this impression that people want to go start a company um, as opposed to the opposite, which you should be motivated by. I want to solve a problem. And, oh, it turns out this is the right way. This is the best way to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Although sometimes people can find something and, you know, I mean, I think there are certain companies, you know, it's interesting, like certain, there are certain companies that become very successful where the, the founder had this long running interest in what that topic is. And then there's others where, they kind of end up in this business then, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, do you like like you think about like Steve Jobs being in Wozniak doing like hobbyist computers, homebrew computer stuff. And that's kind of different than like Jeff Bezos in business school thinking about like what mm -hmm. would be a, you know, and doing consulting, like what would be a good business. And, you know, Jeff Bezos has done okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna take, should we take questions? We can hear you. Great. Um, so thanks for speaking. Uh, I guess my question is first is, um, you know, you kind of talk about how sharing uh, validates the value of content. And I feel like, you know, people share like Gundam style or they share certain content that is very shareable, but not ne necessarily that valuable. So um, you know, I guess my question is, um, you know, you talk about optimizing for social. So to what degree do you optimize for social using just purely data-driven approaches? Or what degree do you have these editorial kind of missions or guidelines that you give your editors um, to say, like, yes, publish this and publish it under this title? Is that mostly data-driven or is that mostly internally policy-driven? Yeah, so, so quickly on the Gangnam style, I think um, <laughs> one thing you have to do with content, with social content, is you have to zoom out and look at, at how... Um, people are using the content. So we think a lot not about what is the content in of itself, but how are people using it. We have a video called uh, "Things Weird Things Couples Fight About. And you watch the video, it's pretty funny, but it's not serious, meaningful thing. It's all these little weird things that couples fight about. Then you look at the comments and uh, on Facebook, and it's all people tagging their significant other, <laughs> saying, this is us, and this is the... And so it's like, you look at it, and you're like, okay, is the media that we're creating that video, or is the media include all the conversations that all these people are having about their actual relationships and and laughing about their actual relationships and you know and and so when you think of content as as being a combination of of content and communication and the two are merged together then you start thinking about things like Gundam style differently where you're like okay how are you know people being silly with each other and connecting with each other yeah is is uh is kind of like people hanging out and and and, t and talking to each other well, it's also why like sort of niche content will work like uh here's 12 interesting foods from russia or something right 
And that might not work in a newspaper, but it works here because, you know, on, the, on Russian Facebook, right, everyone's like, oh, that one's funny, or like someone who's, you know, immigrated or something, and they talk, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a conversation, it's a starting point for a conversation. Yeah, it's people bonding over a shared identity, and, and, and so in terms of the, how much to follow data, I think that, that you want to be very critical of data and spend lots of time interpreting it, and you, you, d you want to continually come up with new creative ideas, and that's the noise that makes, that makes, um, the, the, that prevents you from just finding some local maximum where you're just optimizing to, to something that, that you're, you know, you optimize to a little hill here, but actually there's another mountain over here that you're missing. By having lots of creative ideas and people trying different things and experimenting, and, and, and when you make something that works, don't make the same thing over and over again. Make something different and vary it and see why did it work, and, and that, I think, leads you to new places, and the serendipity of that is important. So we're very much left brain, right brain, art, science, you know, humans trying things, but also looking at data and ha using that as a way to have more insight into what the consumer is, is, is experiencing, but not as the sole guide to what we do. Okay. We'll go switch sides, so let's go here. Hey, um, so I don't know if you saw on Monday, Fusion published a video about BuzzFeed, it was called 20 Reasons Not to Work at BuzzFeed, and I was just wondering what you thought. <laughs> oh, um, I, I, I think that, um, so, so that I think was made by people on the TV side, side mm -hmm. and I think that it, it, it was part of some show they were making, and I have a lot of friends at Fusion, and a lot of them were, you know, like, I, I didn't really, like, follow it that closely, but people were tweeting that, uh, like, all of a sudden people were tweeting that they loved BuzzFeed, on, at, who worked at Fusion, <laughs> and I was like, why are you tweeting randomly that you love us? And I was like, oh, there's some video that is, like, <laughs> say, you know, say, saying that. But I, I, I don't know, I think in general, like, if, if, if um, there's parody and it's funny, then, then like I totally love it. Like the Onion did a little funny thing on BuzzFeed, and there was someone who did a Wolf of BuzzFeed thing that mashed up BuzzFeed and Wolf of Wall Street that was kind of funny. Um, like so it, and like Clickhole is the one. Yeah, and then the Clickhole the fake, does the BuzzFeed. Yeah, and like Clickhole <laughs> does some some things that are funny. And so like in general, if it's funny, then I like it. And 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 if it's and if it's not that funny. Uh, you know, and I try. We try. We don't really take ourselves th that that seriously. Like we we're serious about what we're what we're doing, but we're not so serious about ourselves. So, um, in general, I don't I don't know. It doesn't doesn't bug me too much. Hi. Um, okay. I hope you can hear me. Uh, you talked a little bit about using native video on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Put you at the whims of you know these platforms in terms of how content surfaces and what data you get back. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about like how you deal with the challenge of serving consumers and your mission when things can change very suddenly. So yeah, that's a good question. So we we just spend more time and energy and invest more in making content for platforms that give us data back. You know, so if we if we have a connection with our audience because because when we make things on Facebook, there we're getting back a lot of, of data, then that just encourages us to make more content for Facebook as instead of making it for, for another platform. Um, and when you look at like a platform like Netflix, for example, um, in general, when you sell, con you sell content to Netflix, you get dollars back, but you don't actually know how many people viewed the content. You don't, you don't have any kind of ongoing way to make better stuff because you see the way people are consuming that content. So it's a lot more like traditional television, although it's even less data than traditional television because traditional television has Nielsen ratings. Um, and so we tend to look for platforms that, that are more open and that give us more data, and that allows us to get better over time and continually improve. It's kind of thinking about media as a service, not as an end product. And so if we, um, if we actually are able to see how people are engaging with the content, we can, we can continually improve over time. And, and, and so that's sort of what we, we, we focus on. And so, I, and again, I think if like one platform all of a sudden st becomes more closed, then, then there's a certain type of content that will end up thriving somewhere else, and that's where we would sort of move. I think it's also important to, if you go, you know, if you look at the history of media, there's always this kind of love-hate relationship between the content providers and the distribution channels. Um, but, I mean, they are very symbiotic as well. Like, they, you know, Facebook has, has benefited a lot, I think, from the trend of people making content for social networks. Um, and they know that, and they want to encourage it. Um, and so it's like, at least from our perspective, because we invest in companies that, you know, that whether it's Facebook or Google or Apple, they're on, there's always, uh, on, almost always, there's some platform involved. The way we think of it is, are there, I are the interests aligned ultimately with the platform provider and can they, um, 
can they sort of build a relationship that's that's symbiotic, I guess? Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you look at the cable industry and, you know, you see that all the conversations that like Viacom and Comcast have with yeah. each other, but together they've built, ma you know, massive businesses. Well, and interestingly too, like with cable is a good example where the, the also you'll see the kind of power shift back and forth. Um, so the money flows, you know, started off um, with the content providers paying the cable uh, the, 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 you know, the cable operators, providers, yeah. the cable operators, and then it switched at some point. Right, it switched pretty early on, but it was, yeah, yeah it was like CNN was like, oh, we got to pay the cable operators for carriage. And, and then you see it, it happening, like YouTube was, is sort of more generous on the right, like they'll actually spawn, pay some of the, um, you know, uh, invest in some of the video providers and do revenue shares. And I think especially with video, it's going to get interesting now because you're going to have multiple competitive platforms. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, a while back, uh, one of your editors broke a story about uh, uh, an off-the-record off conversation that uh, an Uber executive wanted to dig up opposition research on a, on a journalist. And I'm wondering, uh, was there any debate internally about uh, whether or not to run with that story? And more generally, uh, do you ever see BuzzFeed becoming a more of a breaking news operation? Yeah, so, um, so when journalists are... Um, you know, when you have an off-the-record conversation with a journalist, it's actually a contract, so it's a verbal contract usually. Um, and so if you're talking to a journalist, and you, you know, I would just say you shouldn't assume that it's off the record. If you make an agreement with a journalist and you say, hey, I want to talk to you off the record, and the journalist says, okay, let's talk off the record, then you know, if it's a credible journalist like, some, like Ben Smith or someone, um, you know, a, a trustworthy journalist, um, you then can talk off the record. Um, but if you don't make that agreement and you just assume because you're in a back room with powerful people and it's chummy and okay, we're all talking, you know, lots of conversations happen in those kinds of back rooms that the public would be very interested to know about. Um, and if you invite a journalist to them and kind of brag about the stuff that, that you know, sketchy things that you're doing and never tell the journalist that it's off the record, um, most good journalists will, will publish the story. Occasionally, there's journalists who won't publish a story because they're like, oh, well, you'll cut off access, or if I do this, you know, you'll punish me later, or whatever. And, and, and I think you see, you know, access journalism in Hollywood a lot. You sometimes see it in Silicon Valley, you know, where, you know, the TechCrunch reporter wants to get a scoop, and so they don't want to, you know, upset an investor or whatever. Um, but in, in general, a good, a good journalist, ha you know, sh has a responsibility to the public first and to, you know, having access to, to, to sources in the future, you know, second. And so, um, so in that story, in that, in that um, situation, there was no conversation about not, not running the story. It's like if you have something that is newsworthy, newsworthy you have a company that is, people are heralding as the next giant Silicon Valley company that will take its place alongside, you know, Google and Facebook like what those people say and how they think of the world behind closed doors is very newsworthy. Um, and it was something that, you know, we broke this story and it was on the front page of the you know, New York Times and the Washington Post and USA Today the next day. So it was something that was clearly newsworthy. Um, so, so in general, um, Ben Smith has, ten, ha, you know, has hired reporters who, who really, you know, feel beholden to the public to tell people things that, that matter to the world. And, mm -hmm. and that's really the, the approach we have. And a lot of great journalists come to BuzzFeed because they know that they can report on stories and they're not going to be making slideshows or aggregating other people's reporting. They're going to be able to do, you know, original stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we've been, you know, we've been doing um, more and more of it. We did a, a story about uh, oil being smuggled by ISIS across the Turkish border that resulted in the <coughs> Turkish government shutting down the, the, the operation. We did a story about an elite prep school in Los Angeles where a student was uh, uh, sexually assaulted by a teacher. Um, that resulted in the headmaster being fired and new policies being put in place to protect students. Um, you know, we did a story about a Russian soldier who um, was caught being inside the Ukraine, or in inside Ukraine when, when the Russian government was saying that, that they weren't inside Ukraine because he posted Instagram selfies that had, <laughs> had location data in the selfies. So we were able to break the story that in fact Russian troops were in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're doing a lot of, um, of, of news, um, uh, breaking news and investigative news and beat reporting and international foreign reporting, um, reporting from you know, uh, um, Liberia for Ebola, for example, which I mentioned before. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big and exciting part of, of what, we're, what we're doing. 
Good afternoon. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about how uh, you allow your staff to have a lot of freedom in terms of the content they want to produce, but with so much new content coming on your website and other websites that produce content every day, how do you guys control as a company for originality and redundancy? Yeah, so I think we will sometimes err on the side of, of like redundancy is, is something that like we'd rather live with as opposed to, to like, like if two people do the same thing, it's not the end of the world and actually sometimes it spreads in different places and people don't sort of notice. It's not like a newspaper where if you have the same article, like you're gonna have a, a massive overlap of people seeing the same thing. So we try to avoid redundancy. We set up groups that have beats that they focus on. We have internal Slack and internal uh, you know, groups and, and email lists. Um, you know, we have a style guide. We have people who are expert in certain areas and so we co coordinate that way. Though we also don't freak out and yell at people if two people end up inadvertently doing a similar hmm. similar story, and it, if it's too similar, we'll we'll you know we may pull one or or note or link to the other one or you know or address it somehow. But in general, in general, um, redundancy is like is like uh, uh, we'd rather have freedom if at the cost of redundancy than consistency at the cost of freedom. Jonah, thanks so much. Um, with regard to leveraging Facebook as a native platform for your content, as a content creator, does their IP license concern you at all with regard to their transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license that you're granting them with your content? Um, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a non-exclusive license, and so I think when you look at tech companies, they if if they're taking part of con of the content that it, that they're that, that is being shared on a, on that platform, they need to be able to to re to reproduce that across all for all of their users, and so there's some rights that they need uh, as a technical matter, uh, for, uh, you know, to do that. Um, but it is an interesting question of sort of what sort of rights, you know, and particularly when you think about um, services with native content where you're uploading entirely to their server and all that, that it raises it raises other sorts of issues. Um, but in general, I think. Um, you know, non non exclusive rights that allow our content to reach millions and millions of people is something that you know that that we're we're pretty okay with. Thank you. All right, hi Ryan here, and I uh, wanted to ask you a question about like when you're talking about comedy, how far is too far when you push the line? When do you make that decision? And after this, will you sign my boobs? <laughs> That was that was a little that was a little too far right okay. there. Okay. I think yes, you, you may have answered your own question there. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, the the problem with comedy. I mean, my sister's a stand-up comic, and and so she thinks about this stuff more than I do. And the problem with I think the problem with stand-up comedy is that if if you say a really edgy joke that's hilarious, people don't mind. But if you say one that bombs, then people are like, that's offensive. And so and it's really hard to know whether your joke's gonna bomb or it's gonna right. be great. So it's a it's a tricky thing for people and in the comedy I was in the comedy for a bigger business. laugh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hi, so I'm sure you've seen a ton of those websites that have URLs like Daily Buzz or uh, just sites that produce content that optimize on shares and buzziness. And I was wondering what your stance on that was, the, those websites that have really clickbaity titles and whether you put any sort of judgment on that or you're just kind of sitting back and seeing that evolution of media. Well, I think that, I think that it's, uh, it's very short term if you try to maximize traffic at all costs and trick the consumer and trick the user. And, and so when I see that, even when I see some of these sites surge, I always think, okay, will they be able to endure? It seems unlikely that you'd be able to endure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you're doing things that are, are really just driven entirely by by traffic and not standing for anything and not caring about quality and not caring about the, your brand and and so and so in ge in general I feel like um, there's this there's a there's a little bit of a problem which is that I I like open platforms because they allow us to connect with our audience but some people abuse open platforms by essentially trying to manipulate an audience and and in the old days of cable you could sit in a room and say like i'm going to make really great programming and it's like okay i'll pay you a bigger affiliate affiliate fee and then like next year when you had the meeting like if you didn't make better programming then the person would be like you lied to me and so there was this like handshake and trust um, i prefer open systems to that kind of a, a back room kind of thing but in that in the back room 
in those kind of backroom deals, there was at least um, uh, some kind of accountability. And I think now you're seeing a similar thing happen, but it's on a longer term horizon, which is you're gonna have blips of people making content in a sort of cynical way, but, but in the long term, you have to build a brand, you have to hire great people, you have to hire people who care about more than just traffic and, who, and, and, and th that will, will in the long term show because the algorithms will change. And if you're making stuff that nobody really actually likes and you're gaming the system, then when the algorithms change, your traffic falls. And if you're making stuff that people actually love and consumers actually want, then when things change, you, you continue to do well. All right, we have five minutes. We have to go. Yeah. Quick questions. Thank you. Um, so how do you feel about Snapchat's new Discover platform then? Because it looks like they're really blurring the lines between a media publisher and then as a social platform too. Um, I think it's it's super interesting. I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the most interesting combinations of s sort of uh, a social media type platform going into a, in a broadcast direction. It's more like broadcast in some ways where there's a few channels and, and, um, and it's, it's um, essentially saying you should look at this and this is like a front page or something that you should check out as opposed to personalized media so i think it's it's pretty different than than what you're seeing in a lot of other apps and it's like a really interesting experiment and and there's some cool things about it and i think we'll we'll, we'll learn from it um and i i kind of like that they're going on their own path and trying different things that that aren't the things you would sort of expect people to do and do you think they're going to use it to break news eventually too I mean, I think they're making, you know, they're, they, they have a channel. So that's the other thing that's very un-Silicon Valley and kind of surprising is that they were like, oh, we're going to have all these partners and we're going to put, you know, uh, content in it, but we're also going to be one of the channels. You know, it's kind of like if Comcast was like, well, now actually Comcast now owns NBC or, you know. So <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, like I think when you look at Silicon Valley, there's, there's, there tends to be like we're a pure platform, we don't make content, and they're actually hiring people and they have their own channel alongside the media, the media partners. So it's, it's pretty interesting and different. And to, to try to do the c make content and also be the platform and the distri distribution and do, doing both is, um, is like a pretty interesting experiment, and we'll, we'll see how it works out. Hi, my name's Maya. Uh, just a quick question. Last year, you guys released your uh, staff diversity statistics, which was really unprecedented for news organizations, and you also released your hiring guide. Just curious how the internal discussions about that went and why you ultimately decided to re release that information and also what impact it's had. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I mean, there's, there's partly a value of transparency around these things because I think sometimes people just don't talk about you know, don't talk about diversity. Um, and sometimes they don't talk about it because they're embarrassed about their the diversity in their own organization. Um, and so you've seen a lot of tech companies that, that aren't, you know, particularly diverse releasing their numbers, even, the, even though the numbers don't necessarily make them look good. Um, so partly it's transparency. Um, partly it's to, it's to show how much we value diversity. And, and I think internally at the company, it has been, it's been something that has been hugely important to our business. The, fa the fact that, um, that, um, when you well, well, when you when you are um, a content company, you're making content for all different types of people with all different kinds of backgrounds. And and I think one of the things that that social media is really powerful about about is what when, when Chris was earl earlier saying, you know, if you're if the Rus if people who are Russian immigrants want to share content, they we can make something for them and it finds them. With broadcast television, that doesn't really happen. You know, you have to make something that 80% of people kind of like. We can for the first time be a media company that makes things that 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 speak to audiences that are smaller in a percentage basis but are millions and millions of people <laughs> on an absolute basis and so uh, diversity has been an you know incredibly powerful thing for our business as well as being a good thing to do you know for for the world thanks Hi, my name's Laura. Um, so in addition to the um, kind of more copycat sites that someone else also referenced, I've seen a really big impact that BuzzFeed's content has had on other media properties and the way that they've started to cover news, even looking at time.com and you know how many puppy videos they're now posting. Do you see, um, I mean, while that's certainly, you know, the eyeballs is supporting their editorial and you know some of their more valuable content. Do you see a danger in that in terms of having two very bifurcated audiences? And do you feel a kind of moral obligation essentially to really try to expose some people that might only be consuming the more entertainment driven content to something more intellectual and valuable? Yeah, so in terms of big companies like Time Inc., I think, I think you know, um, 
copying BuzzFeed or doing BuzzFeedy type things don't, don't, don't address the larger issues for those companies, which is massive legacy print businesses, and in the case of time, massive amounts of debt. That, that, and, and so the, the business that BuzzFeed has, we're profitable and we're growing, but the number, the no, you know, for us to be profitable, you know, is, is, you know, even if they owned us, we, the, the revenue would not offset these massive print declines. For us, it's great because we don't have the, the massive print stuff. So I think there's bigger business issues and the puppies can't, won't solve those <laughs> issues. Um, and then also kind of playing someone else's game is usually not the, the best way to forge, forge, forge a new path. Um, uh, and then there was a second question, I think, which was, oh, oh yeah, and, and, and definitely we, we, um, we see that people, exposing people to new kinds of content is part of what we do, and it's why we don't ever want to have a totally personalized kind of model. We think that personalization can happen with the social networks, and if we can expose people to lots of different kinds of content, news, buzz, life, video, that that, that will, um, you know, that serendipity is part of what a media company has to do and is what a media company is all about. Should we just let the last two people ask questions? So. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Sure. Um, what are you most worried about for BuzzFeed this year? Um, I always worry just about, about culture and execution and growth and how do you keep teams entrepreneurial and how do you keep, how do you keep breaking into the right size groups so that people can go after things and, and, um, and then how do you balance having communication between groups and having people have, have freedom. Um, you know, right now we have video in Los Angeles, we have international, we're opening in all these cities around the world. Like, we don't want everyone to have to make the same mistakes that, you know, and we want people to learn from each other. On the other hand, we don't want, you know, everyone to have to read a manual and check with, you know, other people to do stuff. And so the real thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how do you keep the culture and organization flexible and entrepreneurial? And, and that's really what I sort of see my main mission as a CEO of the company is, is like allowing people to be able to, to, to work creatively and, and, and do, do great work without, and, and have the organization actually help them do better work as opposed to making it harder for them to do their job, which is what happens at a lot of bigger companies. All right, last question, can you be sure. quick? So um, producing original content is not cheap. So do you guys do um, windowing to keep the majority of the views um, for a certain time frame on your site? Um, and then also, how do you protect against content theft? Um, people ripping your videos since you seem to just upload to other networks um, and then other tech blogs or other blogs actually downloading the MP4 and then serving an ad against it that you guys can't capture that revenue. So how do you protect against that content theft? I mean, I mean the main thing, we, we, we don't do windowing. We tend to be pretty open. We publish things to lots of different platforms. And if we are able to capture the vast majority of the scale, people taking things that we do is less, you know, is, uh, is less of an issue because people are discovering on BuzzFeed first and it becomes less of a, it becomes less of a, you know, valuable thing for people to take. And I think there's a CD underworld on the internet and you can fight it a little bit and you can send a takedown request or you can do certain things, but, um, but you know you don't want to also get totally distracted by fighting a CD underworld. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, just to ask you, uh, I guess it's a, tra it's a tradition here. Um, uh, what's your 60-second idea to change the world? So I think the the um, in in a way this gets back to the diversity question, which is which is. Um, I think that the structure of the media industry is changing in a pretty dramatic way, where. Um, mobile, social, digital video, um, and also personalization of you being able to share stuff with your friends or things being recommended is going to allow media, gi media companies to make content for specific groups, specific identities, a broader range of people with, uh, with and, and that is going to have a big effect on the world. I think, for example, marriage equality um, shifted so quickly um, in the US in part because people on Facebook were connected to more connected to people who, who they knew from high school that they may have fallen out of touch with, but they didn't because of Facebook, and they see them living a gay life and, and see like, oh, that's a guy who I respect, and, and it shifts someone who might have been on the fence on that issue. And I think you're gonna see media be able to make content um, for, for a much more diverse audience than ever before and still have it be a successful business, and that is, I think, gonna have a big effect on the world and a positive effect on the world. Great, thank you.